Good day. Today appears to be the day when the Russian Federation, Russia, formally annexes, according to its laws and constitution, the four regions of Ukraine, which conducted referendums about 10 days ago, and which have applied to join Russia. Now, I say formally annexes or I know, appreciate some people don't like the word annex. Unite, if you prefer, these four regions, with these four regions, according to Russian laws and constitution. It needs to be said, of course, that most countries in the world will not acknowledge or accept the reality of this. But anyway, we've had a vote yesterday in the Duma. I understand it was anonymous. And we had this morning a further vote by the Federation Council. Um, as I am speaking, all that is left is for the matter to go to Vladimir Putin and for him to complete the signing of this document, at which point it will become law, and the territories of these four regions will become Russian territory. And there's been, for me, a completely pointless and arcane discussion in some media threads about what the boundaries of these four regions are, which Russia is annexing. I'm going to continue to use the word annex, by the way, and perhaps I should make it clear that I do so in part conscious of the sensibilities of the platform I am using. But anyway, regardless of that, there's been, to my mind, an arcane and frankly pointless discussion about the nature of the boundaries of these four regions. I don't think there's any ever been any real doubt about this. It is the Donetsk and Lugansk regions as created by the Soviet Union, Zaporozhye region as created by the Soviet Union, which, by the way, includes the important city of Zaporozhye, and it includes Kherson region, the entirety of Kherson region, again, as created by the Soviet Union, but with two districts of Nikolaev region, which also participated in the referendum, being attached to Kherson region. So we only have to look at old, the old Soviet boundaries to be clear about where the lines are, what will be, from a Russian point of view, the new international border between Russia and Ukraine. And if we look at those Soviet boundaries, as I said, it becomes absolutely clear what is included in these four regions and what is not. So Krasny Liman, or Liman, which the Ukrainians recaptured a few days ago, that is now formally considered by Russia, or will be as soon as Putin puts his signature to these documents, that will be considered Russian territory, as will the towns of Bakhmut, Slavyansk, and Kramatorsk in Donetsk region, which continue to hold out um, and are still under Ukrainian control, um, and which the Russians no doubt will aim soon to recapture. So will Zaporozhye, the big city in Zaporozhye region, and of course whatever ephemeral gains Ukraine is achieving in Kherson region at the moment. I'll turn to that later in the video. The Russians will want to re uh, um, reverse that as well. And I don't think anybody should be under any doubt that they have the means to do that. As I said, we, we've heard um, this morning that following the um, mobilization that was announced, um, 200,000 men have already joined the Russian army from the 300,000 reservists who've been called up. Um, in addition to those 300,000 reservists who were called up, uh, the Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu says that there's a further 70,000 volunteers who've also asked to serve, and he says that these people 
provided there aren't any compelling reasons why they should not be allowed to join the military, they should be admitted to the ranks as well. So it could be a 370,000 people joining the Russian military, not just 300,000, um, as was announced um, about um, a few weeks ago by Putin on the, I believe it was the 21st of September. And of course, there's a lot of discussion and speculation about when all these men will become part of the military, when we'll start to see this mobilization begin to have effect. But at some point over the next few weeks, we will. And Ukraine's primary advantage up to this point in this war, its numerical superiority, at least in manpower terms, will soon go. Now, what happens now? What do the Russians do over the next few hours and days? Putin will no doubt sign the instrument, the agreements, the law incorporating these regions into the Russian Federation, either today or tomorrow. And he will have four regions, part of Russia, at least from his point of view, but partly occupied by Ukraine. So what does he actually do at this point? Well, there's been an awful lot of speculation. <coughs> there's been discussion about whether the um, current special military operation will be upgraded to a counter-terrorism operation, whether Russia will declare war, whether the Russians will give some kind of ultimatum to Ukraine to withdraw from these territories. Um, I think all of this we'll just have to wait and see. Um, I personally will be surprised if the Russians don't give some kind of ultimatum, if they don't tell the Ukrainians to leave and to leave peacefully. I think that would be a little out of character with the way in which Russian decision making has worked up to this point. But then maybe the Russians will say, well, what's the point of giving an ultimatum which we know the Ukrainians are going to refuse? I don't believe that the Russians will formally declare war. To my knowledge, no country has done so since the end of the Second World War. So I don't think that they will do that. I think it's just conceivable that they might even, given the legalists that they are, uh, this sounds, may sound extraordinary, but they might even refer what they will call aggression to the UN Security Council. The provisions in the UN Charter say that when a country is under attack, it has the right of self-defense, but the normal procedure or the expected procedure is that it will refer that aggression to the Security Council of the United Nations. Now, of course, the United States has an inbuilt majority on the UN Security Council. It's most unlikely, <laughs> it's not unlikely, it's inconceivable that the Security Council would agree with any Russian drafted resolution requiring Ukraine to pull out. But it's what international law expects you to do. So maybe, sticklers for international law that they are, the Russians will do it. The point is that if the Security Council takes no action, a country has the right to act in its own self-defense and I've no doubt at all that Russia will do so, at least what it defines as its own self-defense in respect of these regions. Now, what form will that self-defense take? Will we see an immediate Russian missile and rocket attacks across Ukraine, attacking Ukraine's critical infrastructure, knocking out Ukrainian facilities, destroying bridges, destroying power stations, doing that kind of thing. Perhaps even doing what the Russians have 
in the past talked about doing but have never actually fully done, which is go after the decision-making centers in Kiev. It's interesting, by the way, that the United States opened, has now apparently created some kind of headquarters to um, supervise, well, they say the supply of weapons to Ukraine, but most people believe that it's really to conduct the Ukrainian war, that they've opened this headquarters in Germany. Now, I say that because it's been fairly common knowledge that that headquarters has already existed, but that it's been based in various places in Ukraine, firstly in Lvov at the start of the war, and then at some point it was transferred to Kiev itself. It does look as if what's actually happened is that the United States has relocated that headquarters outside Ukraine and rebased it in Germany. So it may be that the United States is anticipating missile strikes, Russian missile and bombing strikes on these decision-making centers, amongst other things. Who's to say? Um, the Russians did attack briefly various power stations around Ukraine about two weeks ago in the immediate aftermath of the, about three weeks ago in the immediate aftermath of the Kharkov offensive. Putin said that was a warning to Ukraine. It looked like a rehearsal. Uh, it, le it looked like an attempt by the Russians to find out, firstly, what missile strikes like that could achieve and what how Ukraine would respond to them. So it could be that the Russians are going to do something like that over the next few days, or perhaps even hours. I will say one other thing. Um, one of the factors that has, to my mind, started to change the whole character of the war is that over the last day or so, General Autumn has intervened. Now, there's been heavy rains in Ukraine, there's been heavy cloud cover. Um, apparently, the ground is already starting to soften. And already, that uh, those rains and the softening of the ground seems to have um, blunted Ukrainian attempts to advance beyond Krasny Liman to the village of Kremenaya and perhaps to other places. I'm not saying that we are yet in the position where everything has turned to mud, but it's beginning to work out like that. Now, I should say that the cloud cover doesn't just work to the advantage of the Russians, the defenders. We've just had an example in Kherson region of how um, the change in the weather actually has acted on this occasion, in Ukraine's, in Ukraine's, um, to Ukraine's advantage. About three days ago, the Ukrainians launched an armoured uh, offensive um, um, along um, uh, a roadway um, right at the north-eastern edge of Kherson region. Um, the road a big asphalt road that leads along the um, left bank, the, the east, the west bank of the Dnieper River. Now, there's a lot of speculation about what this purpose of this armoured offensive was. Some suggest that it's all part of some complicated envelopment exercise to try to envelop the Russian forces that have been successfully defending um, Davidov Broad, and Andrivka and those sort of places. Others say that it was intended to advance all the way down to Novaya Kakhovka to capture the bridge and the dam and in effect to create an operational crisis for the Russians. Now I have to say I think it was the second even though all kinds of Russian bloggers claim it was the first but my own view 
is that this, this sort of operation gives every impression of having been really intended to capture Novaya Karkovka. Anyway, it made some progress along the road, about 30 kilometers, quite a distance, partly because the cloud cover made it very difficult for the Russians to bomb this um, tank convoy as it moved south. It then reached a place called Duchadny, still very far away from Novaya Karkovka, and um, the result, and there um, it was stopped. The Russian defenders blew up a bridge. Interesting that they did that, by the way. And apparently this convoy, which has already suffered considerable battering, um, this convoy came to a stop. It's not able to advance further towards Novaya Karkov Karkovka because there are large uh, reservoirs and water obstacles now in its way. And um, the fact is, in my opinion, it only got as far as it did precisely because the cloud cover made it difficult for the Russian Air Force to bomb it. Now, I should say that there's, again, considerable argument about what the Ukrainians are going to do. So you get Russian bloggers, people with a pessimistic perspective, who still think that the Ukrainian objective is to carry out some kind of enveloping operation across what is probably becoming increasingly muddy and soft ground to encircle places like Davidov Brovd and Andreevka and to force a Russian pullback from these places. The other view, which has been expressed by Russian officials, is that this column, numbering perhaps a thousand men in total, which apparently started with something like 35 tanks and 15 armoured vehicles, but which has, as I said, already been badly hit about, that it's in effect trapped, that it can't really advance off the asphalt road across the what is already becoming increasingly soft ground, that it's been badly hit by uh, Russian artillery operating from the east bank of the Dnieper River, and that during breaks in the clouds, the Russian air force is able to bomb it and um, inflict great damage upon it. Well, I'm not a military expert, I'm not on the ground, I'm not going to say who is right and who is wrong. I will say, on balance, that I think the military officials, the people on the ground, the uh, people who are running things in Kherson region, who say that it's the Ukrainians who are in a trap and that this grand envelopment people are talking about, well, they don't even contemplate it. I think that's more likely to be the truth. But then, as I said, come back to what I've said many times, I'm not a military expert. <laughs> so there we go. Anyway, the point is that with General Autumn intervening, um, offensives are going to become, at least Ukrainian offensives, are going to become more complex. And I would have thought that this would give the Russians more time, more time to train up their reservists, build up their armed forces, prepare for the offensive which is coming. Now that doesn't of course exclude some sort of aerial campaign, some sort of missile strikes against infrastructure and bridges and all that kind of thing. And perhaps that's what we're going to see. But again, let me reiterate a point I've made many times. The Russian high command doesn't share its plans with me. And clearly there's been a great deal of dissonance and debate and argument about what to do within the Kremlin and the general staff. And um, I suspect that even now, those arguments and those debates have not been entirely resolved. Now, there's been a lot of discussion and a lot of 
argument about why the Russians waited until September before announcing this partial mobilization. And we now know that at least one Russian general, General Lapin, was calling for it as far back as June. Roughly the time, by the way, I remember when Scott Ritter was uh, making commentaries, also saying that some kind of mobilization by the Russians was necessary in order to bring the war to an end. Now, why did the Russians wait so long? Well, I think there were a number of reasons. I've discussed one of them many times. I've said that um, from a Russian point of view, it was essential to sell this to their strategic friends and allies, China, India and Brazil and other countries in the Middle East and Africa and elsewhere. And that one had to take things in order. And I think that probably is correct. I also think that perhaps the Russians underestimated the fact that many of their reservists would... Um, Many of the people, rather not reservists, many of their professional contract soldiers would go to elect to go back to the civilian life when their contracts expired in August. As I said, I have experience of this and I'm sure this is the kind of thing that happened. And there is a third factor, which is, of course, um, that perhaps announcing mobilisation in June might not have been well received at that time by the civilian population that drawing this out, showing to the Russian people that um, mobilization was necessary um, because the Russians weren't able to hold ground without having all their troops there, all the troops that they needed there. Well, maybe that was also something that the Kremlin calculated needed to happen. I think there might be a fourth explanation, which I haven't talked about up to now, but which I suspect, again, was very important for Putin and for his officials. And that is that I think that Putin and the Kremlin and the government, the Russian civilian government, would have probably been somewhat concerned about how the economy might respond if mobilization were to take place um, at a time in late, uh, early and late summer when it was still unclear what would be the overall effect of the sanctions. I think that one of the reasons that the Russians have now felt able to press forward with mobilization is because they're now confident about the stability of their economy. And in fact, Mishutsin, the Russian prime minister, has now issued a, vari a variety of economic decrees which seem to point to uh, parts of the civilian economy being brought under, more parts of the civilian economy being brought under control, centralised control, to support the mobilisation, which suggests that economic factors have played a role and that this decision might have been in part delayed to make sure that the economy wouldn't implode if it were done. Well, I would say that the ruble has continued to be solid throughout all of these events. In fact, if anything, it's appreciated slightly, appreciated against the dollar, which, as we know, is rising against pretty much every other currency. So if the Russians are confident that they can now carry out a mobilization in this sort of way and that the economy can withstand it, it looks as if they have reasons for that confidence. Anyway, that's the situation in Russia. What about the situation elsewhere in Ukraine? Well, Zelensky has now passed a decree outlawing negotiations with the Russians um, in light of the decision to 
by the Russians to annex these regions. All of which I would say plays directly into the hands of the hardliners and enables the Russians to go around and point out to people that this is further proof that um, Ukraine, it is Ukraine that is being intransigent and isn't prepared to negotiate under the pressure of its Western sponsors. There's been a very interesting article, by the way, by in Global Times from the Chinese, uh, the Chinese uh, government owned um, unofficial English language newspaper, which also treats Ukraine, Ukraine's actions with extreme cynicism. And it points to the fact that the United States basically brushed off Ukraine's latest request for NATO admission. And Global Times, it's in fact an editorial, says US doesn't see Ukraine as a NATO ally, but as de facto cannon fodder. And it says that Ukraine, by persisting with this war, is letting itself be used by the United States expending the lives of its men and demolishing its economy in order to serve a US strategic play. And I suspect that Chinese analysis is one that many will share, and I suspect that they will look at Zelensky's latest decree, and it will fortify them in, that, in their view that Zelensky is in effect simply carrying out the US's orders and that there is no real point or purpose in conducting negotiations with him, which is of course exactly what the Russians want other countries to think. So anyway, um, in the meantime, Zelensky is still seeking economic support. The United States has said that they will give Ukraine $1.5 billion of economic support each month. They've just, Ukraine has also received an IMF loan. I think most people who look at this conclude that this isn't anywhere near enough um, relative to what Ukraine actually needs. And there's reports that Biden himself is becoming concerned about this, that he had a conference with the US's allies, and he was trying to get them to drum up more financial and economic support for Ukraine. Now, that of course poses a whole lot of problems, because to say it straightforwardly, if the United States now seems to be moving rapidly towards a recession. The US's European allies are now clearly in a state of crisis. And I say that, I'm obviously making this program in Britain, where the government, the British government, the Truss Kwarteng government, has been thrown completely off balance by the reaction to its budget proposals of just over 10 days ago. It's had to pull back on one of its um, more eye-catching proposals, the abolition of the 45% rate on higher earners and its reduction to 40%. Um, Conservative MPs who support the government in the House of Commons, um, a large number of them, 80 by some accounts, made known that they would not support this proposal if it was ever put to the House of Commons, which would have resulted in the government's defeat on a budget issue, which might have, if that almost certainly would have, resulted in the resignation either of the Chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng, or the Prime Minister, Liz Truss herself. Anyway, the latest word is that there are now demands from these same Conservative MPs for more reversals of government policy. That there is opposition to any cuts in benefits for uh, lower income people, all of which is commendable in its way, but it doesn't, of course, answer the underlying budgetary crisis 
which Britain is now facing. In fact, it's becoming very difficult to see that there is any actual plan or policy at the moment in Britain that anybody can agree to. And one gets the sense of a government that has lost control, both of the economy and of the political situation, that is surviving from day to day, um, and is only able to do so because the Bank of England, against its own declared intentions, has resumed QE. In other words, is once more buying bonds on the government, the British government bonds market, the guild, the guild market. So one senses a government in free fall, its electoral support has collapsed, it's lost control of the economy, and indeed the economy is increasingly looking in Britain as if it is out of control. Are things better anywhere else? Well, this morning I woke up to a statement by Robert Habeck, Germany's Vice Chancellor and Economics Chief, the man who, in my opinion, bears the single greatest responsibility more than anyone else for uniting Europe and Germany behind this economic war of attrition that has been waged against Russia to such devastating consequences for the European economy. And he's come out and said, apparently, the Germans aren't saving enough energy, that energy um, expenditure in Germany is too high, and if things continue as they are, Germany will run into energy shortages at some point. He didn't, it seems to me, say precisely when. Well, what I could say is, he's the economics minister. I mean, um, he's now blaming Germans for Germany's economic problems, which he, as economics minister, seems to have largely created. I wonder how much longer Germans will accept these kind of lectures from people like Habeck. And if we do start to see German factories starting to close en masse, and we start to see unemployment in Germany swell, whether the, I'm going to say it straightforwardly, hysteria that he has traded in ever since the start of this crisis, back in February, how much traction that hysteria will continue to get amongst German voters. Anyway, we'll see. The Russians, by the way, are now going around saying that the damage to the Nord Stream pipes is repairable and that they're ready to repair it. That may be true or it may be not, or may not be true, but one way or the other, it does look like it's being set out in order to persuade Germans that perhaps, despite the destruction of the explosions on the Nord Stream pipelines, there is another way. They're not totally committed to this thing. What well, we shall see. And of course, what happens in Germany affects Europe. And in my opinion, it's only a matter of time if we start to see production falling in Europe. In fact, it's falling already. But if things start to get critical mass, it's only a matter of time, both in Germany and in Europe, and of course in Britain, before this starts to feed in to the financial system. And if it does feed into the financial system, at some point, the contagion will reach the United States as well. And then, what? More QE, probably. Maybe a reversal of the Fed's policy of raising interest rates. This at a time of higher inflation. The only thing I've seen coming from the Biden administration is a plaintive, a very plaintive statement that it's now circulated to the Global South, telling them that it's all in their interests to agree to this price cap on Russian oil exports. 
that's going to be beneficial to them because it's going to presumably reduce the price of oil. To my mind, the very fact that the United States is making those kind of claims, these kind of statements, shows that the big importing countries, China, India, and the rest, are making it absolutely clear that they remain completely unenthusiastic, indeed hostile, to this price cap idea. So, more financial aid for Ukraine from Europeans, more financial aid from the United States. We shall see. <laughs> anyway, there we are as of today. Again, this is a fast moving situation. Or maybe not, maybe General Autumn will make it less so. But one way or the other, it's always possible when I make these videos on any particular day, that by the time it's published, events will have changed. But as of this moment in time, this is what I think the situation is. Now, what happens next, we will see. The ball, or so it seems to me at the moment, is in Vladimir Putin's court. We will see how he chooses to play it over the next few hours and days. And we will see whether he takes any action on the military side of things and how he responds. But that will be for my next video to discuss. This is where I stop. I wish you all a very good day. I would remind you that you can find us on our other platforms, uh, Locals, Rumble, um, BitChute, Odyssey, Telegram. Please remember that on Locals, every Wednesday at 1400 hours Eastern Standard Time, 1900 hours London Time, I do a live stream which you can join and where you can directly ask me questions. And you can also find me you can also support us, rather, on uh, uh, via Patreon and Subscribestar, links under this video, and also by going to our shop and buying yourself all the amazing merchandise that you will find there, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, and all those great things. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. Thank you for joining me again today and more from me soon.